Well, that's a bit of a hard act to follow, but I'll do my best. Thanks to the worship team for that great introduction to what it means to be community. So the message this morning, I'm going to be talking about community, and that's kind of a big word. We hear it all over the place. And so I'll be talking a little bit about what are maybe some of the qualities or um, characteristics of a Christian community, the church community. And one of the things about community is that we all want community. We all long for it at some level. And yet, it's difficult. We also resist it in some ways. The truth is that community is hard work, but it's work that's worth it because it leads to unexpected gifts. Now, I've been a member of a few communities over the course of my life. Um, My high school youth group, where I first came to know the Lord, uh, the college residence, seminary, where community was an emphasis. Uh, I lived at Kingsfold Retreat Center for four years as part of the resident community. And then I've been a member of New Hope for about 16 years, actually. Right around this time of year, I started attending New Hope by mistake about 16 years ago and never left. So. Community has been a big part of my life, and I've thought a lot about it over the years. And I think um, each of these communities that I've been part of, I've loved. And they've been a big part of my life and my life with God. And each of these communities have loved me, and they've been a part of my, my transformation over the years. I've been transformed by God's grace and presence in and through community. And over the years, especially at my time at New Hope and at Kingsfold Retreat Center, I've thought a lot about community and I've observed a few things. First, we are made to live together. We are made to live with one another. We're not made to be alone. We're made to belong. And many people say that they want to be part of community, and yet, they resist it. In fact, we all resist it in some ways because it is hard work. It means putting up with things and people that aren't perfect and maybe sometimes even things that aren't good. It means having to come to terms with our own imperfections and limitations. And it requires a commitment that goes beyond looking to meet my own need. And the last thing that I've observed about community is that no community can thrive without the capacity to forgive. If we can't forgive one another, if we can't even forgive maybe the institution we're part of, then we might as well go home right now (laughs) because the one thing we can count on is that we'll be disappointed in one another and in community. But that doesn't mean that it's hopeless, and that doesn't mean that it's not worth the work. Community is an invitation to discover our gifts and our weaknesses. And while we want to discover our gifts and find a place to use them, we don't really want to discover our weaknesses. Even when we really do want to grow, it's hard to have our eyes opened to the things in us that are broken. It's hard to come to terms with our own flaws and frailties. Our society values individualism and independence. And there aren't very many places where we are encouraged to own our weaknesses and our need. And the church should be one of those places where we are given freedom, permission, and are even encouraged to just be ourselves, including our imperfections. The truth is that to be happy in community, you have to be humble enough to admit your faults and failures. You have to be able to acknowledge the limits of your humanity and to have grace towards others who are also limited in their humanity. But the beauty of this kind of acceptance is that when we do uh, enter into community like that, when we enter into relationships like that, 
we're actually given freedom to be maybe more than we could be when we don't have that freedom. We're given the capacity to really live fully when we don't have to be perfect, when we don't always have to be strong or right. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, Life Together, and um, so Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a martyr in Germany during the Second World War and a pastor and theologian. And this is kind of one of the classic books written about community. And in it, he talks about the fact that as Christians, we don't actually make the community, but we enter into what is already established by Christ. And when I think about New Hope Church, I know, I know that there are many here, probably, hopefully, most of us here, that have experienced a sense of belonging and feel that they are part of a community here. But I also know that there are many who have been part of New Hope Church in the past who have left because they didn't find a place to connect. They didn't feel known. And I know that there are probably some here this morning who come Sunday after Sunday and they don't feel like they are known or like they know anyone else. And maybe some of that is by their own choice and is where they need to be, but maybe some of it isn't. Maybe some of it is that they really want to be known, but they just haven't found the way or the place to do that. And this, this reality grieves me, and sometimes it really frustrates me. But the words of Bonhoeffer actually bring some comfort. Because all of us are bound together through our union with Christ. And this is a mystical reality, whether we feel it or not whether we know the person behind us in the row or not. Bonhoeffer writes, and it's it's not gender inclusive because of the time that it was written, uh, so I apologize for that. So when it refers to the brotherhood, it means the whole fellowship, not just the men in our fellowship. So Christian brotherhood is not an ideal which we must realize. It is rather a reality created by God in Christ in which we participate. The more clearly we learn to recognize that the ground and strength and promise of all our fellowship is in Jesus Christ alone, the more serenely shall we think of our fellowship and pray and hope for it. So the fact that community is a mystical reality doesn't mean that we don't have room to grow. It doesn't mean that we don't have uh, the responsibility to nurture community and to work at it and to help uh, people feel like they belong. We still want to feel the sense of belonging, to be known, not only by name, but truly known. And this is important and something we need to grow in. And in fact, our leadership team um, is thinking and praying about that. And next weekend, we have a leadership retreat. And that's one of the things we're going to spend time on is how do we nurture community, this community that Christ has already established? How do we nurture the realization of that in our community, in New Hope Church? I think as we do that, though, as leadership and as members of this church, it's always important to keep in mind that this is a reality that has been established by God, that we participate in, that we cooperate with God in, that we don't make it happen and we can't make it happen. It's only going to grow through the work of the Spirit and through Jesus' presence in and through each one of us. The Apostle Paul wrote lots of letters to churches, churches that were experiencing all kinds of issues and struggles. And I'm going to use a few um, of his quotes this morning. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6, he exhorts the church, he encourages them. 
He says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Again, the admonition here is to keep the unity that the Spirit has already given. So our responsibility is to, I guess, attend to the ways that the Spirit is inviting us to participate and to be part of this unity and of this community. So community invites us to be ourselves. And one of the phrases um, in the song that we sang, lean on me when you're not strong, it invites us to not only offer our gifts and strengths, but also to be known in our weaknesses. And I think this is actually the reason that many of us avoid entering in deeply. Uh, we don't really want to be confronted with our limitations and our weaknesses. Unfortunately, though, this is the only way we can experience true community. If we're only willing to be strong, capable, and together, we're never open to the gifts that others have to offer us. In some of my relationships at Kingsfold and at New Hope especially, there have been times when either I've been confronted with my sin and my weakness directly, often indirectly, but sometimes directly, um, by another person, or I've had to point something out to others. And when this has happened, there's always been a deepening of trust through these experiences. We tend to think that those kinds of encounters would bring a separation, but they actually bring greater um, communion, greater togetherness. So they've happened a few times here at New Hope, and anyone who's been part of our staff meetings can attest to that happens fairly regularly. <laughs> um, but they, they happen, we have to deal with them, and we have to be open to them. And they're not always easy. It's difficult to sit and listen when someone tells you how much of a jerk you are. Um, when I've had to listen when someone has confronted me with my pride or my anger or my resentment, when they've been honest enough to say, you know, that's, that's not right, that's not good, that's not who you are meant to be. It's difficult to hear that, to sit and listen and receive it. But when you know that the person who's doing that loves you, then we can do it. We can have capacity to receive those words. And the sense of freedom to be our imperfect self grows. So Sharon uh, Bell, I lived with her at Kingsfold for a number of years, and we had some encounters of this nature where we had to confront one another with uh, ways that we were functioning with one another and with others that weren't good or healthy. And I asked her for some of her reflections on community, and she wrote, community calls me to live authentically with others, showing warts and all. Authenticity breeds deep love, acceptance, joy, freedom, vulnerability, truth, confidence, and of course growth along with pain. God can keep me accountable to him and to others in community. And when we experience enough acceptance and love to let our limitations show, we really are finally beginning, be beginning to experience the gifts of community. Now, I'm not saying that we have to expose all of our weaknesses all of the time, but when we refuse to expose any of our weaknesses any of the time, we're not living authentically. And community can't thrive when we feel like we have to protect ourselves 
and bolster our reputations and pretend to be better than we really are. So I did ask a few others that I know in the community about um, just some reflections, and a very few got back to me. <laughs> so uh, when asked to name one thing about a community, uh, the three Van Dyke women responded, love, one said love, one said acceptance, and the other said belonging were words that, for them, um, expressed what community was about. And they felt that there needs to be a level of being accepted before you can feel like you truly belong. And love kind of precedes being accepted, so they're all connected. When we love one another, we can accept one another, and then we can feel like we really belong in the community. Acceptance of who we really are. How powerful is that? Henry Nowen writes a lot about community in his writings. He lived in uh, a large community in Toronto for the last years of his life and had a lot of uh, reflections about community. And he writes about forgiveness and community. Community is not possible without the willingness to forgive one another 77 times. See Matthew chapter 18, verse 22. Forgiveness is the cement of community life. Forgiveness holds us together through good and bad times and allows us to grow in mutual love. But what is there to forgive or ask forgiveness for? As people who have hearts that long for perfect love, we have to forgive one another for not being able to give or receive that perfect love in our everyday lives. Our many needs constantly interfere with our desire to be there for the other unconditionally. Our love is always limited by spoken or unspoken conditions. What needs to be forgiven? We need to forgive one another for not being God. And this week, I was confronted with this. I had to say no to meeting with someone for prayer because I had to write a message about community, which is kind of ironic, but true. I had to come to terms with the limitations that I have with my time. And I had to be honest with her and with myself that I am not God. And she has to forgive me for that, and I have to be able to forgive myself for that too. So no community can survive without the capacity for, to forgive one another. Because as I said earlier, the only thing we can really count on in community is that we are going to disappoint one another. And this may seem like a pessimistic view, but if you've ever lived with someone, you know that it's true. We're not perfect. We're only human. And that means that we will hurt one another that we will make mistakes, and that if we don't have the capacity to forgive one another, and again, maybe even to forgive ourselves, we're finished before we even start. Um, I don't actually know how to say his name, but Chris, Christopher Huarts, it's just a new book, it's called Unexpected Gifts, Discovering the Way of Community. He writes in this book, ironically, as much as we yearn for deep friendships and meaningful communities, many of us seem to be unable to find our way into them. Even though we know we're made for community, finding one and staying there seems almost impossible. Though we hate to admit it, if we stay long enough in any relationship or set of friendships, we will experience failure, doubt, burnout, loneliness, transitions, a loss of self, betrayal, a sense of entitlement, grief, and weariness. Yet it's these painful community experiences, these tensions we struggle to navigate, that actually hold unexpected gifts. And I think even as I was thinking about this quote, I was like, well, what, what actually are those unexpected gifts? Um, he explores them in his book, if you want to read it. I've only gotten halfway through, but it's very good. I think 
again, one way that I have experienced that in the last couple of months, I have experienced a sense of weariness, and I have had to depend on others for strength, and they have been faithful to support me, and that is a gift, and I am very grateful for it. Again, Paul writes in uh, one of the epistles in Colossians this time, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Learning to persevere when we experience these um, failures and disappointments and losses lead to entering into the community, again, that Jesus has already given. Bearing with one another when there is failure and loneliness Betrayal and weariness opens us to receiving from one another, too. Community is not just about, about what I want or need. It's also about giving to the other, giving and receiving. Paul wrote in Philippians 2, verses 1 to 4, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ... If any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but but each of you to the interests of others. And I actually think that, well, there's lots of things that make entering into community difficult, but I think this is one of the difficulties maybe in our modern generation, that we were taught to look for what we can gain. When we come to a community, we look for what it's going to give us. But Paul's invitation is to look at what we can give, not just what we can receive. And I have to acknowledge that there's been a tendency in the church to take advantage of, of this verse, maybe even, and other verses, that the church has maybe tended to use people and to take what they have to offer in an unhealthy and maybe even sometimes a manipulative way but I don't think that's the kind of service that Paul is referring to. We're made to share our life and our gifts with one another. And when we try to hoard our life and keep it to ourselves, we actually end up losing it. When we can be generous toward others and toward God with our whole self, with all of our gifts and who we are as people, then we're actually made more alive. And I know... I know that there are many in this community who don't look to their own interests, who give from their hearts, their time, their money, their gifts, their love. I've experienced in this community the truth of what my friend Sharon expressed, the joy and freedom of living authentically. And I want more people to feel that. I want everyone who comes to New Hope Church to experience that, to know that they are accepted, that they belong, to feel like they're known and loved, to feel like they have a place to give their gifts and to receive the gifts of others, to be accepted with their weakness and imperfection as well as with their strengths. And I have to confess that I honestly don't know how to get there as a church. I don't have the answers for how we're going to become that. But maybe that's okay, because 
I can't know for all of us. We each need to listen for what uh, part God is inviting us to, and I can't tell you what that is. It's not something that our staff or our leadership team can do for us. We have to do it together. And the only way that we can do that is to be attentive to how God is inviting us to participate. We have to choose to choose community, to choose to be faithful even when it's hard, to choose to give what we have to give even if it feels like not very much. Choosing community over individualism and independence is only possible when we recognize that Jesus is the one who binds us together. Jesus is the one who helps me to love, and Jesus is the one who forgives me and gives me the capacity to forgive others, and again, maybe to forgive myself when I fail. This morning, when we were praying uh, before the service with the worship team, Karen uh, read this prayer. It's the prayer from this morning, um, or today. Maybe it didn't have to be this morning. Um, From Seeking God's Face, It's the closing prayer, and as we end our message and um, move into a time of communion together, I'm just going to pray um, this prayer on our behalf. So I invite you to pray with me. God of true happiness, your kingdom gently subverts the illusions I live with. Who would have thought that knowing my misery would lead to joy or comfort? That admitting I don't have it together might bring blessing? Still, I am drawn to illusions of self-sufficiency. I ask for your mercy to see my own spiritual poverty so as to know more of your rich deliverance. And we pray, Jesus, too, that we might have our eyes and hearts and ears open to all the ways, whether big or small, that you are inviting us to participate in and build a sense of community together. Amen.